Well, good morning, everybody. Would you stand with me as we prepare to worship? And we read in Psalm 135 these words. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord and give praise, O servants of the Lord who stand in the house of God, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good, and sing to his name, for it is pleasant. And so seeing as how we have gathered together this morning in the house of God, in the house of the Lord, let's do just as the scripture says and sing praise to him. Sacrifice of praise. A city on a hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Your glory on display. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy. It's uncontainable. You're coming like a flood. Our hearts are filling up. All things are possible. All things are possible. Awesome in this place. Jesus, you are awesome in this place. Worthy to be praised. Jesus, you are worthy to be it comes to uh, repentance and confession, we often fall into one of two ditches. The first being that we don't take our sin nearly seriously enough. We simply blow it off and think of it as no big deal because God's mercy is great. You know, He forgives us. But the other ditch is that we, you know, realize the seriousness of our sin and so we confess often and we come before God and admit our faults and our shortcomings and we think, this has got to be the millionth time I've come before God with this. Can he really forgive me again? And the answer to that is, well, of course. When we realize the seriousness of our sin and we come before God and we admit in humility that we've come up short yet again, he is faithful and just to forgive when we repent and confess. And so knowing that, let us go before him yet again with our shortcomings, with our faults, our failures, and our sins and ask for the mercy that only he can give. 
And let's do that now with the words of this prayer. Lord, hear my voice. Sin has gotten a hold of me and darkened my life. Wickedness has drawn me in. We fail again and again. But when we come back to you, you always receive us. For you are a merciful God. Your grace will come like the dawn. You will redeem your people. All glory be to you, Father, Son, and Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Take just a moment to silently confess any particular sins to God. Friends, having confessed your sins to God, hear this word of comfort from 1 John chapter 2, which says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And so having received that forgiveness and mercy, through Jesus Christ, let's continue to worship together.
know, we're called to worship God in both spirit and truth, but without some sort of way to anchor ourselves to the truth, we are like a ship that's blown about wherever the wind and sea wishes. And so one of the ways to anchor ourselves to the truth is to keep coming back to the basics, to the foundation, to the start, to the core of our faith and professing and proclaiming what it is that we believe time and time again. And so I invite you to do that now, to anchor yourselves to the truth, to remind yourself of where we stand, of what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed and in answer to this question. Horizons Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one true church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is my He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. And what He did for me on Calvary more than enough. I trust.
trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
bow your heads and pray with me? Father, may it be true of us that we build our lives, we lay our foundations on nothing other than you. Father, everything else will crumble and fail and give in and shift. But Father, you are sound and sturdy. You are a sure foundation. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are faithful and good and trustworthy. And so, Father, I pray that we would build our lives on that firm foundation. And that we would resist the temptations of the enemy and of the world to try and pick up anything and everything else to build our lives on. Because, Father, again, you are the only sure foundation. And so I pray that as we continue in our time together, as we hear the preaching of your word, that we would continue to build our lives on you, that you would teach us something about yourself, that we would fall a little bit more in love with you, that we would draw just a little bit nearer. And that, Father, we would be a people who are sound and sturdy because we have built our foundations on you and on the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Why don't you give somebody a hug or high five or handshake and welcome them to Horizons. Well, good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. It is awesome to have you guys with us on uh, what is about as pretty a morning as I think I could dream up. It is gorgeous outside, and it is a wonderful day to be at church with you guys. So thanks for coming out to worship with us. Uh, if you're new or recent around here, if this is maybe your first time, a special welcome to you guys. Thanks for coming out this morning. My name's Lucas Jarrett. I'm the Connect Pastor here at Horizons Church. And if we haven't met you yet, if this is your first time or one of your first times, we would love to get a chance to meet you, introduce ourselves to you, get to know you a little bit, tell you a little bit about Horizons Church, all that good stuff. And so right after the service... Right over there where that welcome sign just lit up, uh, Pastor Steve's giving the message today. And right after the service, he'll be hanging out right over there. And if we haven't met you yet, come right over there, say hi. Uh, we'd love to get a chance to meet you. Uh, we got a free gift for you and uh, give you some intel on how you can get connected here at the church, all right? So come do that if you're new or recent. We haven't met yet. And uh, if you haven't downloaded the app, you can go ahead and do that, whether you're new or recent or not. Uh, you know, smartphones have been uh, the, the, uh, the cause of a lot of evil, I think, but... You know, you can get something good out of it. So, you know, if you're going to carry one around, you might as well try to get some good out of it. One of the ways you can do that is uh, downloading our app. You've got access to stuff in service you can use, connection card, sermon notes, and then even stuff on the go. If you have uh, you know, want to catch up on sermons you may have missed or anything like that, you've got the full sermon catalog there on the app. And if you would uh, like to uh, make giving part of your worship, you can do that through the app or through our four ways to give. And so uh, we are grateful for your guys' generosity. And if you want to continue to give, uh, you can use any of those four ways on the screen right there to do it, all right? We do have a couple special things coming up that I want to put on your radar, make you aware of. One of which is you've heard us talking about a captivating retreat for the ladies coming up. We've got a uh, men's retreat, a Wild at Heart basic men's retreat coming up very soon as well. This is at the end of the month, October 31 through November 3rd. That's a Thursday evening through a Sunday. So you don't have to take off work on Thursday evening. You can, you can drive down after, get there, and then you'll be back by early afternoon Sunday. Um, but this retreat has been a, uh, a big marker in a lot of guys' lives who've been to these, uh, these retreats. This has been something they can look back on and say, something changed that weekend. You know, my life is going this direction, and then there's a stake in the ground where the Wild at Heart retreat happened, and now I'm going that direction. And so if you're uh, looking for a way to try to get to the root of maybe some of the wounds in your heart, to have more wholehearted faith, the Wild at Heart retreats are a phenomenal opportunity to do that. I highly recommend you going, all right? So we've only got, I think, like five or six slots open. So if you're at all interested, I would uh, jump on it. I would get registered. You can do it online or at least ask some questions if you're curious, want more info because there's not a lot of slots left, all right? So men's retreat, Wild at Heart coming up into the month. The second thing is towards the end of the month, the 27th, we are having a membership class. 
So uh, whether you've been around here for a long time or you know not very long at all, if you're not an official member of Horizons Church and you would like to become one or you're interested in what that would look like, the membership class is your next step. So you're not on the hook for anything if you come and attend this. You're not suckered in and then you can't get out. It's not one of those things. But uh, if you uh, come and want to be part of uh, our church as an official member, this is your next step. You're going to figure out what that looks like, uh, what it means to be a member at Horizons Church. And so that's going to be Sunday morning, October 27th, during the 930 service in the loft next door. I'll be over there teaching that, and you can register for that online as well. Okay? I think that's it for me. Uh, the only other thing is the prayer room over there to my left and your right. If you'd like someone to pray with you at any point in time in the service, please head right on in there, and uh, whoever's man in that room this morning would be more than happy to do so. Okay? we got a quick video announcement, and then Pastor Steve will be up to deliver the message. We are about to listen to a message taught from God's Word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery, using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything, and your child will appreciate the extra freedom. Well, good morning. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had a birthday, and my daughter, uh, Heather, asked me, said, Dad, do you feel 71? And I said, every bit of it. <laughs> <clears throat> so I can feel my age creeping up on me, and uh, at some point, I'll have to retire. And, uh, but until that time comes, I keep looking for ways to stay viable in the ministry a little longer. One of the ways I've I have uh, do that as I work for 10 months in the year and I get paid for it, and then I take two months off and don't get paid for it, and I kind of recharge my batteries during those two months, and it kind of, that strategy's worked pretty well to kind of extend me. Um, so this year, I stepped away from my duties here at Horizons in mid-June. I came back in mid-August, and um, when I came back, the most common question people asked me was, well, what did you do on your time off? And uh, usually, and uh, normally, when I I have those couple months off. I do some projects around our, our place, and then I work in some, some motorcycle rides around it. But this year, I did less riding, and I tackled a bigger project because we have a, um, we have a hillside below our house that's always been a bit of an eyesore. And when we bought our place 10 years ago, that hillside looked like that, that section over to the right, that ravine kind of kind of uh, made you walk by with your hand in front of your face, you know, just didn't want to look at it. So when it rained, the water would rush down that hillside, wash out everything in its path, and over the years, that ravine became a dumping ground for broken bricks and chunks of cement and old nails and landscape timbers. I even found an old, uh, an old wash tub, a wash machine tub buried in that hillside with a little bit of it sticking out. It was a haunt for uh, groundhogs and skunks and ticks and chiggers, you know. Um, so over the last uh, few summers, I started reworking it. I put a waterfall in the middle of it, and, and then I, re and I spent a few summers reworking the left side of that ravine. But this, this summer, I decided to finish a project and improve the right side of that hillside, that ravine. And so I started in June, and uh, the hillside over on the right side of the waterfall, you can see the waterfall in the middle, on the right, that was the hillside I wanted to, I wanted to give a facelift to and rework it. And so I, I, um, I set out to uh, improve that side of it and started out in June, started working on an idea I had in my head. And, and that project ended up in August about I don't know, 300, 350 hours later, and uh, it looked like this when I got done. Now, you can see there's three walls going up through there with a couple, ter three different terraces, and that middle wall you see right there is made of, of uh, stone. And while I was making that middle wall, I was laying it out. I had created the first terrace, and I was laying out that middle wall I saw something in the dirt about eye level, a little above eye level to my left move, and it caught my eye, and so I turned to see what it was, and when I looked, it was a black snake, 
and uh, about three foot long, and he was, he was entangled in a ball of netting that someone had thrown over that hill years ago, and part of that netting was buried in the dirt, and part of it was sticking up out of the ground, and for some reason, that's, that snake decided that he was going to try to crawl through that, that uh, ball of netting rather than go it around it, and that was a fatal mistake for the snake because halfway through that netting, he got stuck. He couldn't go forward. He couldn't go backwards, and it didn't matter how he contorted his body, twisted, turned, or thrashed around, he was trapped and he couldn't get free. And if he couldn't get free, he was going to die in that ball of mesh, mesh right there on that hill. And so I had to decide if I was going to pick up my machete <laughs> and end his struggle, <clears throat> or if I was going to set him free and let him live. And I decided to set him free. But when I reached down to, uh, to pull that, that buried netting out of the dirt so I could free him, that snake coiled up and struck at my hand. And so I had to decide a second time. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to end his life or set him free. And I decided once again to set him free. And so I distracted him over here with my right hand. And I reached around my left hand and I laid hold of him right behind, right under his, his neck, right under his head, and uh, held him to the ground while I pulled that, that netting that was buried up out of the dirt. Because I thought once I pulled that netting up, it would ease the grip that had, that had on the snake and I could just pull it off of him. But I was wrong. That snake had got himself so entwined in that ball of mesh, I couldn't remove it. So I, I reached over and I got a pair of scissors out of my tool bucket and I, and I held him to the ground and I got up fairly close to him and I cut that, a big ball of that netting off of him because I thought surely once I cut the netting, I'll be able to strip it off of his body and, and free him from it. But I was wrong again. I got that big wad of netting off, but... Uh, it was so, that left part that was left was so tightly wrapped around his body, I couldn't get it free. And all the time that I was trying to, trying to cut that loose and trying to see if I, that crazy snake was thrashing around trying to get rid of my, get out of my grip, and he was trying to reach out and bite my hand. Well, I finally managed to, uh, to uh, get that free, and I, I said, well, Gosh, this is a lot of work. So I had to decide a third time, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to end this snake's life or set him free. And I decided I was going to set him free, so I picked him up so I could cut that netting off of his body like that with those scissors. And as soon as I picked him up, he wrapped himself around my arm. <laughs> and, he held, and, he, and, he, and he wrapped himself around as tight as he could. And then he began to squeeze me as hard as he could. And he thrashed his head back and forth as violently as he could, trying to get loose so he could strike and hit my hand. Well, there I was on the hillside with a three-and-a-half-foot black snake <laughs> wrapped around my arm. And, I, you know, I could barely get the, the scissors underneath between him and the netting, and I'm snipping it off of him a piece at a time, trying to uh, set him free. And piece by piece, I finally cut it off him and got him free from it. And when I finally got the last piece of netting off him, that snake was squeezing my arm so tightly, I had to literally pry him off my arm. And when I finally got him off my arm and I put him on the ground, his first reaction was to coil up and try to strike the hand that had just freed him. And when he finally realized that he was free, he slithered away, found a hole in a hollow tree, and disappeared in the darkness. Now, I'm not sure what I expected from that snake. <laughs> but he seemed a little ungrateful to me. <laughs> and as I thought about how that snake reacted when I laid hold of him and rescued him from a slow and painful death, my, it triggered a memory in my mind of something that happened years ago when I was a kid growing up on the farm. Because when I was about 11 years old, we had a, we had a beagle. He wasn't one of those short-legged beagles. He was a long-legged beagle, and his name was Tip. And Tip loved to hunt. And in fact, he'd, lo he'd love to hunt so much, he'd hunt with you or he'd hunt without you. 
And Tip would disappear for hours into the fields and woods around our house, tracking his latest quest. I always knew where Tip was because as soon as he got on the trail of something, he'd start barking and I'd hear him move. And so I knew where he was because I could track his movement by his barks. But one day afternoon, I stepped outside and I heard Tip barking in a field down below our house, but he wasn't moving. He just kept barking in the same place, and that seemed odd to me, so I told my dad. He got concerned, and so he headed out through the fields to go find Tip. And when my dad finally found him, Tip was in pretty bad shape. He'd been out on the trail of some animal, and he tried to jump over a woven wire fence, and he didn't quite make it. His front feet cleared the fence, but one of his back feet got tangled up in, that, in the wire, and there he was, hanging helplessly upside down from one leg from that by that fence, whimpering and barking for help. If my dad hadn't stopped what he was doing, gone out and found him, Tip would have died there that night. But my dad did find him. And when my dad found him, he laid hold of him and he lifted him up and he pried those wires off of his leg And Tip whimpered, and he winced in pain, but he never growled, and he never snapped at my father. And when he was finally free, he didn't run off into the darkness. He got as close to my dad as he could. And Dad brought Tip home, and when he did, he he rested in my father's lap and wagged his tail, and he licked my dad's hand as he treated his injuries. My father saved Tip's life that day, and Tip always had a special bond to my father after that. And there ends the difference between a snake and a dog. You see, if free a dog from a trap, he'll become your best friend. He jumps into your lap, he wags his tail, and he'll lick your hand in gratitude. But free a snake from a trap, there's no gratitude. He'll fight you every step of the way, and when you finally set him free, his first instinct is to bite your hand and slither back into the darkness. Now, we're going to discover today that every one of us has managed to get ourselves hopelessly entangled in a web of sin. And that web of sin is certain to destroy our lives, sabotage our relationships, and set us up for eternal ruin. And try as we might, try as we might to free ourselves from that trap We can't get free. Many have tried. All have failed. We can't be religious enough. We can't do enough good things to wiggle out of that trap. And we can't take enough drugs, drink enough enough booze, or sleep with enough people to forget that we're in a trap. The simple reality is if someone doesn't hear our cry and come to us, if someone doesn't lay hold of us and set us free from the trap of our sin, we will die in a trap of our own making and we will face an eternal ruin. But the good news is someone has seen your plight. Someone has heard your distress. Someone has come to set you free and his name is Jesus. But here's the deal, to set you free, to set you free, he has to, he has to lay hold of you. There's no other way to get you free. He has to lay hold of you. And the question is, how will you respond when he does? Will you lash out at Jesus like that ungrateful snake and slither back into the darkness from which you came? Or will you jump into the lap of God? Kiss the nail-pierced hands of your Savior and live like a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. Will you respond like a snake? Or will you respond like Tip? Now, I don't speak snake. But I'm pretty sure that that black snake resented me laying hold of him because he was pretty sure that if he just twisted and turned and struggled a little bit longer, he'd find a way to wiggle out of the mess he'd gotten himself into, and he would save himself. He didn't need my help. And I don't speak beagle, but I'm pretty sure that Tip knew that he'd gotten himself into a terrible mess that he couldn't get out of, and if somebody didn't hear him barking and whimpering and find him and set him free, he was going to die hanging upside down from that fence. When my tip had hung there for a long time when my dad found him, 
He was in a lot of pain when my dad finally got to him. But I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, when Tip saw my dad walking towards him, his tail started wagging. And he was more than ready to have my father lay hold of him, lift him out of his entanglement, and set him free. Now today we're going to, go, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. And in that chapter, the Apostle Paul is going to take us back to the day when Jesus tried to lay hold of him and set him free from the web of sin that he was in. Now initially, Paul's encounter with Jesus didn't go well. Because initially, Paul responded to Jesus the same way that snake responded to me. When Jesus tried to lay hold of Paul and set him free, he lashed out at Jesus. He hated him, and he tried to pers started persecuting his church. When Jesus finally talked to him about it, he said, you were kicking against the goads. You were kicking against, you were kicking against my, my hand reaching out to you to try to free you. You see, Paul resented Jesus trying to lay hold of him because Paul didn't think he needed to be rescued. In fact, he didn't believe he was even walking away from God. He believed God was walking away from him. He believed and he was convinced that if he could just observe the Old Testament ceremonies carefully enough and keep the Old Testament laws perfectly enough, he believed that if he could do that, then God would be so impressed with his good life that he'd have to turn around and he would have to accept him. And if God accepted him, his problems would be solved, and he didn't need Jesus, and he didn't need his forgiveness. But then one day, Paul was traveling to the city of Damascus to arrest Christians and imprison them. And Jesus appeared to Paul on that road outside the city of Damascus. He knocked him to the ground, brought him to his knees, confronted him with his sin. And for the first time in his life, Paul realized he was in deep trouble. He was in a situation he couldn't get out of. He didn't need to live a better life so God would turn around and accept him. He was helplessly ensnared in sin. And the only way he was going to escape certain destruction was to let Jesus lay hold of him, forgive him, and set him free. And for the first time in his life, Paul realized he wasn't pursuing God. God was pursuing him. And if he would let Jesus lay hold of him, forgive him, and set him free, it would change his life, change his destiny. That was a transformative moment for the Apostle Paul. It changed not only where Paul would spend eternity, but it changed how he, would, how he would spend the rest of his life, how he would live, how he would serve. But that's not just Paul's story. That's our story too. Because as long as you believe as long as I believe that we can wiggle free from sin by living a better life, we'll just recoil from Jesus and strike at his hand when he tries to lay hold of us, tries to set us free. Because I tell you, the truth be known, we don't think we need him. We think we can get through this ourselves. We can figure it out. But when we have a moment of clarity like Paul, when we realize that we're helplessly ensnared in this ball of sin, when we finally dawns on us, if Jesus doesn't help us and set us free, we're eternally doomed. When that moment of clarity comes, it changes everything. And rather than lashing out at Jesus, we kiss his nail-pierced hand. And we live like a grateful follower of Jesus Christ. But that day will never come. A day will never come as long as you believe that you must pursue God until he says yes to you and accepts your best efforts. That day will never come. That day will only come when you realize that Jesus is pursuing you. And you must say yes to him. And you must let him lay hold of you and forgive you and set you free from your sin. And that brings us to this first life principle. God lays hold of me not because I pursue God until he says yes, but because God pursues me until I say yes. We got it backwards. We're not pursuing God. God's pursuing us. Now, Paul begins the book of Philippians by warning us about a problem. It was a problem in his day, and it still recurs to this day. People still struggle with this. 
He warned them not to listen to false teachers and misinformed friends who were telling them that they had to keep the Old Testament law and observe Old Testament ceremonies in order order to be accepted by God. You see, the Old Testament law of Moses that God gave in the first five books of the Bible, those, those, that law was set up to do three things. The moral law of Moses was a mirror that we were, we, when we look into it, it shows us where we've fallen short from God's, God's standards and is a continual daily reminder that we are sinners and need to be forgiven. Now, the sacrifices of the Old Testament Mosaic law provided a way to have those sins temporarily dealt with. It was called a kafar, a covering. And it was a way that God provided to have our sins covered until the promised Messiah would come and not cover our sins, but take them away. And so when people made sacrifices, they were making it in faith that this temporary covering would someday, someday the Messiah would come and take those sins away. And the ceremonies of the Old Testament law were living pictures of what that Messiah would do when he actually came. For example, the Feast of Tabernacles was a picture of the truth that the Messiah would come and tabernacle or dwell among us when he came. The Word became flesh, and what did he do? Dwelt among us, he says. The Feast of Passover foretold that the coming Messiah would be our Passover lamb. The physical circumcision, the the rite of physical circumcision in the Old Testament was a picture, a picture of a time when the Messiah would come. And he would not circumcise our bodies. He would circumcise our hearts. So when Jesus came, he came as that promised Messiah, and he came to fulfill all three of God's purposes for the law so he could set us free from that law. He fulfilled the moral law by obeying it perfectly. He fulfilled the sacrifice of the law by becoming the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he he fulfilled the ceremonies of the law by doing the very things that those ceremonies depicted and pictured the Messiah would do. In short, Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses so we could be free from that law and live by the law of Christ. Therefore, Paul has very harsh words, very harsh words for anyone who teaches that we are still under the law of Moses. Now, in Paul's day, there were people who were teaching that you didn't need to be forgiven by Christ at all because if you just followed the law of Moses carefully enough, God would accept you. Now, Paul had been caught in that trap for years, and he was, he was vehemently rejected. He vehemently rejected that heresy. But there were others who were teaching that you needed to accept Jesus as your Messiah, but ultimately Jesus' death and salvation was not enough to make you right with God because if you really wanted to be accepted by God, you also had to keep the law of Moses. And the Apostle Paul, the book of Hebrews, the Jerusalem Council, all of those things completely and fully rejected that heresy. And so when Epaphroditus came to Paul and told him there were folks in the the city of Philippi where he came from that were teaching these heresies there in the church, Paul was very upset, and he wrote these words. He said, watch out. Watch out for those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh, those people that want to require you keep the Old Testament law to be accepted by God and, and be circumcised and keep all. He said, he called them dogs. He said, they're mutilators of the flesh. For it says, as for it is we, Christians, who are the circumcision. It is we who Jesus has come and he has circumcised our heart. It's we who worship by the Spirit of God, who in the glory of, who glory in Christ. We, we don't glory in the law. We glory in our Messiah, Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh and our ability to keep some law to be accepted by God. We are accepted by Jesus, and that's why we're accepted by God. He says, though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anybody had a reason to be confident in that kind of an approach, he says, I got it. If anyone thinks he has a reason to have confidence in the flesh, that keeping the law, keeping the ceremonies, Doing the sacrifices, anybody was to think that doing those things would make you right with God and be accepted by God, said, I've 
gosh, I'm, I'm the guy because, you know, he said, I, I much more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people. I'm of the people of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Judah. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm regarded as regards to the law. I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for legal, legalistic righteousness that comes from trying to keep the rules, the law, he says, gosh, I was faultless. You couldn't put a blame. You couldn't point out a problem in me. See, Paul's question is, what can save you? A picture or a person? You see, the law of Moses was a picture of the coming Messiah. It was a picture that said, Messiah's coming, and here's what he'll do when he comes. But Jesus is that promised Messiah. So why would you cling to a picture and believe that a picture can save you when the person that that picture depicts is here? That's his argument. How many of you walked down, when you got married, you said, don't bother coming to the wedding, honey. I've got a picture of you. I'll just say I do to the, <laughs> to the picture. I'll bet none of you did that. Pictures don't save you. Jesus saves you. And so cling to Jesus, not the picture of Jesus. And Paul went to a, took that argument even a little bit further, and he says, look, if keeping the Old Testament law could make us acceptable to God, if that was a way to be okay with God, then, gee, I wouldn't need Jesus because I'd, I'd be golden because I was a rock star when it came to keeping the Old Testament law. He said, I was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. That first king came from the tribe of Benjamin. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, just as the law requires. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I wasn't an also rand. I was top shelf. As a Pharisee, he said, I didn't just keep the law of God's laws. I kept the laws about God's laws that were written in the Mishnah. In fact, he said, I was so zealous for the law of Moses, I persecuted the followers of Jesus because they claimed to be free from the law of Moses. So I imprisoned them, and I tried to get them killed. I was so careful about keeping the laws of Moses and the ceremonies of Moses and the sacrifices of the Mosaic system that no one could find fault with me. And yet... Despite all my impeccable credentials and all my moral achievements, I was hopelessly trapped in my sin because I was clinging and put my hope in a picture. And a picture cannot save you. Only a person can save you because only a person can lay hold of you. Only a person can forgive you. And only a person can set you free. And Paul said it like this. In light of this, what did I do? He says, but whatever was profit to me, whatever I counted as part of my pedigree, I consider now as loss for the sake of Christ. If I can have Christ, all that doesn't matter. If I can have the Messiah, that's what the word Christ means, the Messiah. All those things don't matter. What's more, I consider everything over here that I used to do to try to get God's approval and all those pedigrees, all those accomplishments, all those old stars on my, all those things. They're lost compared to the surpassing greatness that I now know as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. For those for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider all these things as trinkets, monopoly money, rubbish, he says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Because if I'm found in him, I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes from me keeping the law well enough. No, I have a righteousness that comes through Christ, it comes through faith in Him, faith in my Messiah, the promised one that the law was pointing to. And that righteousness is not something I earn. That righteousness is a gift. It comes from God, and I receive it by faith, he says. So Paul's point is, I used to look to, I, I used to, he says, past life, I used to cling to my resume. I used to insist I was such a good Jew that I didn't need a Savior. God would accept me because of my efforts. But then I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. I realized my spiritual pedigree was worthless. It was rubbish. And I needed a Savior. I needed a righteousness that didn't come from trying to be a good enough person that God would accept me. I needed a righteousness that came to me as a gift from Jesus, my Messiah. I needed a righteousness that came from Jesus laying hold of me, forgiving me, and setting me free. That's the kind of righteousness I needed. 
You see, if you believe that if you just live a good enough life that God will accept you, you really, the, the logical consequence of that is you really don't believe that you're a sinner. And therefore, you really don't believe that you need a Savior. Now, you may say, well, Steve, come on. I know I'm not perfect. Okay, okay. Let's just do a little test. If that's your argument. No, I'm not perfect, but, you know, I think I'm all right. Here's the test. If you don't, if you, people say, to be a table, tell me this all the time. I said, well, I know I'm not perfect. I said, well, tell me one thing you've done wrong. They can't do it. No, tell me one thing you ought to go to hell for. They can't do it. So here's the test. If you say, if you're here today and you're saying, no, I'm not, I know I'm not perfect, but I don't think I need this salvation thing. Go home and write down 10 things, 10 sins that you know you've done. Write them down, specific 10 sins. And by the way, I love people too much and I try too hard. That doesn't count. And if you can't list at least 10 sins that you know you've done, then you don't really believe you're a sinner. You don't. And if you can write down 10 sins, then you know, you know, you know that you're ensnared in a trap of your own making and only Jesus can set you free from certain destruction because the reality is you're not pursuing God. God is pursuing you. And if you'll own your sin and bring them to Jesus, he will lay hold of you, forgive you, and set you free. And when Jesus lays hold of you, rescues you from your sin, and sets you free, it will change you, my friend. It will change you. Because from that moment on, the great passion of your life will be to let go of your old life so you can lay hold of Jesus and live into the new life he has for you. And that's the next life principle we want to look at. God laid hold of me so I could let go, of, let go of my old life and lay hold of Christ and the new life he has for me. Jesus laid hold of me so I could know him. I could lay hold of him, and I could lay hold of this new life he has for me, but i got to let go of the old life to do it. Now, every four years, we have an opportunity to, in America to have a legal revolution. Did you know that? It's called an election. <laughs> I'm all for a legal revolution, aren't you? In about three weeks, you can join me and participate in that revolution. I hope you will not sit this out. I hope you will do that. I hope you will, you will go do that. Uh, join me in that. But if you were to ask me, how, how, well, Steve, how do you know you're going to even be able to vote and participate in that revolution? I'd reach into my billfold, pull out a card that's called a voter registration card, has my name on it, and say, hey, see here, I'm bona fide because I got a card. I can participate in the revolution. But if you ask me, how do you, but how do you, if you ask me a different question, I said, well, how do you know that you're a bona fide Christian? How do you know that? How do you know that Jesus has laid hold? How, do, how can I know that Jesus has laid hold of me? How can I know that I've been forgiven and set free? How can I know that? You might have noticed that Jesus doesn't issue ID cards when you enter his kingdom. You can't just flash a card and say, see, I'm bona fide. I got a card. You can't show people your card, but you can show them a changed life. That's what you can show them. You can show people a life that tells them that Jesus has laid hold of you because when Jesus lays hold of us, forgives us, sets us free from our sin, it changes how we live. And if it doesn't change the way you live, you're faking it. Now, when Jesus laid hold of Paul on the road to Damascus, he immediately quit persecuting Christians, and he began a lifelong quest to figure out how he could know Jesus, lay hold of him, and live into this new life that God had for him. He says it like this. He said, when I realized this was all, this was all, I was clinging to the wrong thing. This was just a picture that was telling me that the Messiah was coming, and he has come. So I let go of this, and I clung to this. He said, when I realized that, this was my new purpose in life. I want to know Christ. I want to know the Messiah. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. I want to become like him in his death so that somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Christ, he said. And if you want to know Jesus, if you want to know Christ, gosh, you've got, you got to spend some time with him in prayer. You've got to spend some time with him reading this book. How would you know what Jesus said and did if you didn't read the four Gospels? The four Gospels tell us what Jesus said and did in his earthly life. 
The book of Acts tells us how Jesus can guide our life by showing us how he guided the, the life of Christians in the church in the first century. The epistles translate the things that Jesus said into Bible practice, into, into doctrine and practice so we can follow it. The book of Revelation tells us that what Jesus is going to do when he returns. You see, if you want to know Jesus, you got to read his book. You got to pick up your Bible. You got to spend some time in prayer talking to him. You need a sacred space like this. You absolutely need this for corporate worship. But you also need an inner sanctum in your home where you get along with Jesus. You spend time with him in prayer, studying the Bible and reading and reflecting on and getting to know him. You need that. You need it. And when you come out of that inner sanctum and you seek to live like Jesus lived and do what Jesus did and teach what Jesus taught, you'll very soon figure out that you need a power greater than your own willpower to pull that off. Because to live a life like that, you need to tap into the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you know who raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit of God. He was raised up by the Spirit, we are told. And that's why the, Jesus, when he left this earth, he gave us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us so we could do and live the very life he's called us to live. But if you live like Jesus lived and you do what Jesus did and you teach what Jesus taught, guess what? You're going to be treated like Jesus was treated and you're going to learn, you're going to suffer for your faith. You'll share in this Christ's suffering. He says, I want to know, I want to be know the fellowship of his suffering. We'll live like Jesus lived and do what Jesus did and teach what Jesus did. And you will share in his suffering because they will treat you like he was treated. But you'll know Jesus a little deeper because you'll share in that suffering. And the North Star that guided Jesus' life and his ministry were seven words. These seven words led him to his death. And Paul said, I want to, I want to know, I want to share in, in what led him to his death. I want to share in that. Well, what led Jesus to his death were these seven words, not my will, but thine be done. Living those seven words led Jesus to the cross. And if you want to know Jesus Christ deeply, you must live those seven by those seven words yourself. Live by the very words that led Jesus to his death. And you will share in that. You'll figure out a little bit more about your Savior. And there's part of you that will die, so part of the new part of you can live. Not my will, but thine be done. Now, you know, uh, here at Horizons, we define a disciple as a person who lives to make a difference for Christ in a dark and decaying world. That's how we define a disciple. Because being a disciple isn't about how much you know. It's about using what you know to advance the cause of Christ. Using what you know to, to further the kingdom of God. Because when Jesus laid hold of you, guess what? He had a kingdom purpose for your life. He had a kingdom purpose for you to fulfill. And one of the great goals of every disciple of Jesus Christ is to live into that purpose. When Jesus laid hold of me, he wanted me to do certain things. He said, teach them to do. Not just teach them to know, teach them to do. He has a kingdom purpose for your life. And disciples, every disciple lives into that purpose as best they can. And that brings us to our third principle. When God laid hold of me, he had a kingdom purpose for me to live into. And my goal is to lay hold of that purpose. That's my goal. When Paul, Paul knew he wasn't a perfect man, but he also knew that he didn't have to be perfect to fulfill the purpose that God had given him. I mean, think about it. Jesus launched Christianity with 12 guys. Were they flawed or perfect? Pretty flawed guys. And he's been advancing the kingdom of God through imperfect people for 2,000 years. And that was nothing new. Nothing new. God's been using flawed people to advance his cause since, since the fall of man. He used a murderer named Moses to write the first five books in the Bible and to tell us, don't murder people. Go figure. He used a reluctant warrior named Gideon to overthrow the Midianites and free Israel. He used a man named Paul who hated Gentiles, hated Jesus, and persecuted Christians to take the message of Jesus, whom he said he hated, to Gentiles, whom he despised. 
and lead them to Jesus and for salvation all over Asia Minor and Europe. He used a guy like that. Paul knew he was a flawed man, but he also knew that Jesus had a kingdom purpose for him to fulfill. Here's how Paul put it. He said, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. I know I'm not, I haven't lived a perfect life or done ministry perfect, but I press on to do what? To take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. When Jesus took hold of me, he had a kingdom purpose in mind, and I want to lay hold of it. I want to live into it. I want to seize it. God had a dream for me, and I want that dream. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I'm forgetting what is behind. And I've, he said, I've made a number of mistakes, but I forget what is behind. I, I learn from my mistakes. I patch up what I can, and I strain. I strain forward towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me to, this, to a, heavenward, a heavenward prize, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul knew. Paul knew that he had not only... Not only had Jesus laid hold of him on the road to Damascus, but he'd given him a kingdom purpose. He knew that because a guy named Ananias came to him and said, and God sent him to him. He said, go tell this man that he is to carry the, the, the message of Jesus and the name of Jesus to Gentiles all over the world and to their kings. Go tell him that. And he did. And from that moment on, fulfilling that purpose became the compelling mission of Paul's life. He didn't do it perfectly. No, he, he knew he didn't do it perfectly. But he did it. He learned from his mistakes. He patched up his errors. And he kept on going. He, was, he, left his, he left his flaws. He left his imperfections in the hands of Jesus. He left them behind him. And he kept straining to advance the cause of Christ in a broken world by doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that Jesus gave him to do. When we don't do something perfectly, we often sit down and quit. Jesus says, if Paul said, I didn't quit. I kept going. I was talking to a guy the other day here at church, very excited. He was about to retire, but he wasn't excited that he was going to prop up his feet and do nothing. He was excited because he sensed that there was a kingdom purpose on his life that he was going to be able to do once he retired. I think that's pretty cool. I can't wait to see what God does through him and how that works out, how that new arena of his life plays out. But what what God is doing in, in his life, what is true of him is also true of you. There is a kingdom purpose upon your life. Jesus had a, had a dream in mind for you, for, you, for you to fulfill. And you'll never experience the joy and fulfillment that you crave until you live into that. So what do you call a person who's laid, who Jesus has laid hold of, who's who's trying to know Jesus deeply? What do you call a person who's tapping into the power of Christ's resurrection and joining Jesus in the fellowship of his suffering and laying hold of their kingdom purpose? What do you call a man? What do you call a woman who does that? Well, in Philippians 3, the end of it, the last few verses, Jesus calls them a citizen of heaven because their goal is to make a difference for Christ while they're here on this earth, but they know that their real home is not here on this earth. It's in heaven and so while they're serving Christ in this broken world, they have, they have their eye on the eastern sky because they know that one day, one day, one day, Jesus is going to break through those clouds and he's going to return and I may live to see it. And when he comes, we're going to leave this world and we're going to go live with Christ in our true home. And that leads us to this final principle. God laid hold of us so we could live as citizens of heaven until Jesus returns and lays hold, so we can lay hold of all that God has for us. 1986, I was in Israel for about 10 days with three friends. First night we were there, I was, uh, we stayed in a motel on Tel Aviv on the shores of the, sea, of, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea. I was very excited to be there. And I was seven hours delay. It was a seven-hour difference uh, in West Virginia time and there. And so even though it was very late, I couldn't get to sleep. And so Larry Bell was with me, and, I, and we got together and said, let's go out. We can't sleep. Let's go out on the beach and check out the beach and go put our foot in the, sea, in the Mediterranean Sea and say we did it. And so we headed out the door, but we hadn't gotten very far into our little adventure before we found ourselves surrounded by army jeeps filled with soldiers with rifles and machine guns. <laughs> They want to know who we were, where we were from, what we were doing out in the, on the beach in the middle of the night. And I said, Larry, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, 
We're in a foreign country where terrorists are dropped off on the beach in the middle of the night so they can walk into a building and blow people up. And so I was informed that if I wanted to enjoy my stay in Israel and not end up in an interrogation room with bright lights in my face, that I should probably not get a, go out and uh, wander the beach in the middle of the night. It was a stark reminder that I was in a foreign country where people think and they act differently than we do back here in almost heaven, West Virginia. But you know what? I get a very similar feeling every time I turn on the television, every time I read a news, a news reel, every time I try to walk, watch some woke movie. It's a stark reminder that I'm a pilgrim living in a foreign land, a land that has very different values and very different beliefs than I do because my true citizenship is not here. It is in heaven. But my job while I'm here is to live, not to live like the world around me, but to be an ambassador for my king, to advance the interests of his kingdom until, until he comes back for me and he calls me to my true home. And when he calls me to that true home, he will finish the transformation in me that he started when he laid hold of me. Here's how he finishes this book. Their mind, this world around us, their minds on earthly things, but our citizenship as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong. And we eagerly await a Savior from there whose name is Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him, who by that who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, is going to do something very special for us. He's going to transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body because one day Jesus is going to descend from heaven with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and he's going to say, come up here. And all those Christians who died before us will rise up from the dead and they'll be given a body like Christ's. And then those of us who are alive and remain when Jesus returns will be caught up in the air. The Bible says we'll meet him in the clouds. And we too will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And our perishable bodies will be exchanged for an unperishable body like Christ. And for the first time since Jesus laid hold of us, we'll experience everything God has for us. And for the first time since Jesus laid hold of us, will be in a place that feels like home. And God says, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. And so as, as we make a difference for Christ in this dark and decaying world, we serve a king. We, do the, we live into the calling he's given us. As we do those things, this prayer is on our lips. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord. And that's an amazing story to me that Jesus has laid hold of us that we can know him, that we can fulfill our kingdom purpose in this broken world, and we can do that till Jesus returns, takes us home, and transforms us. And that, my friend, is the taproot of our joy. That's the taproot of our joy. Lay hold of that story. You will lay hold of joy because when you lay hold of that story, you won't live like some ungrateful snake that lashes out at Jesus and slithers back into the darkness. No. No, you'll crawl into the lap of your father. You'll kiss the narrow, pierced hand of your Savior, and you'll live like a grateful follower of Jesus Christ until Jesus comes and take you home. Lay hold of that story. You'll lay hold of joy. So let's go home. Let's pick up our Bibles. Let's find our inner sanctum. Let's get to know Jesus. Let's go out and make a difference for him until Jesus comes because one day he's coming for us, and he will take us home. And that is the taproot of our joy. God bless you. If I haven't met you yet, I'll be right over here. All right?